Team one. Very good. Thank you, Zoom. Um, yeah, so it's my pleasure to introduce um, Professor Mark McRyzen. Um, so uh, Mark um, did his undergraduate in uh, Tel Aviv, um, and then he did his PhD at the University of Texas um, at Austin um, under Stephen Weinberg and Jeff Kimball. Um, then he did postdoc uh, at NIST before going back to UT Austin when he joined the faculty, and he is now the Sid W. Richardson Foundation Regents Chair of Physics. Um, Mark is, is well known for um, kind of many breakthroughs in experimental quantum optics and optical atoms, including the first experiments demonstrating optical squeezing. Um, he's won many uh, awards and prizes named after the illustrious forefathers of quantum optics, uh, like the, uh, the Lamb Medal, uh, the Planck Award, and the Rabi Prize. Um, and he's going to be telling us today about controlling and cooling of atoms using photon entropy. So please uh, take it away, Mark. Thank you very much. Uh, and it's a pleasure to be here virtually. Uh, I'm sorry that I uh, could not be in person, but a um, unexpected family responsibility made it impossible for me to travel. So uh, I'd like to thank the organizers, um, Christian, Sebastian, for, and, and Anil for, um, for the first of all, for the invitation to speak and also for the accommodation to allow me to participate by Zoom. And I've been listening to all the talks uh, all this uh, today and uh, found it very interesting. So um, today, oh, and also uh, in honor of Pi Day, I, I was looking around to see if I had any pies, but the only thing I found was a piece of old cherry pie in the freezer and it was totally gross. So after this <laughs> symposium, I'm going to go get some fresh pie. Uh, <laughs> uh, today, I want to talk to you about controlling and cooling of atoms using photon entropy. Let me uh, let me switch to a slideshow. Can people see that? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. Um, uh, and uh, let me start by um, by saying a few words about um, uh, cooling of atoms generally in 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 my field, and I, I think there's probably some experts in the audience as well. Um, in particular, I want to say a few words about what has been called the atom laser. Perhaps a bit of a misnomer because laser is an acronym for light amplification by stimulated emission radiation, and, and an atom laser is not light, but that's the best acronym we have or name we have. Um, and in the path to making an atom laser, which is a coherent beam of atoms, uh, the starting point has been laser cooling and trapping at, of atoms. A tremendously successful method that uh, was recognized by a Nobel Prize in Physics in 1997. Uh, and it fundamentally relies on the uh, momentum of the photon that is imparted to atoms as they scatter uh, light from a laser. Um, the next step after cooling atoms near the absolute zero, um, although the, the phase space density, which is roughly the occupation probability of, of an atom in a cell, quantum cell of phase space, is only about 10 to the minus six. And to reach quantum degeneracy, one has to get up to order unity. So you have to fi somehow find another method of cooling that can take over when laser cooling reaches its limit. Uh, that method so far has been evaporative cooling of atoms, and it works and allows uh, one to get to uh, a quantum degenerate gas of either bosons or fermions. Uh, here I'm going to focus on on uh, bosons and and then to realize the, uh, the the state of a Bose-Einstein condensate, also recognized by Nobel Prize in Physics in 2001. Now, uh, uh, obviously, these all work together to produce an atom laser, but the weak link in this picture is evaporative cooling, and and because of the fact that it's slow. Uh, typically, evaporation time can be tens of seconds or even minute, uh, and also because it uh, involves a, a, a great loss of atom number. Typically, one throws away 99.9% .9 of the atoms during evaporation, uh, combined with the fact that it's not a general method because it relies on elastic collisions. Um, that has limited the flux of an atom laser to about 10 to the 5 atoms per second. So I think it's fair to say that if the laser itself 
was limited to 10 to the five photons per second, we wouldn't have many applications for lasers these days. That's, uh, you know, 100 femtowatts of, of laser power. Um, and, and for many things that atomic physicists want to do, uh, they are satisfied with, with such small numbers. But as I hope to show you, there are some uh, fundamental tests and also precision measurement where more is better. And so the challenge is how do you make an ultra bright atom laser? How can we really boost that flux substantially? Um, and so looking back, looking at this some years ago, um, I got interested in this question. And the, the obvious place where one could make improvements uh, was evaporative cooling. And so that's kind of motivated the initial work in my group. Let's try and find an alternative to evaporative cooling. So you have to go back to the first principles and think about it uh, in, a, in, a, in a more general sense. And I want to uh, briefly discuss the well-known thought experiment proposed by James Clerk Maxwell in 1871, which has been known as Maxwell's demon. And I'm sure you have all learned about it. Um, this picture, uh, which I lifted from Wikipedia, uh, shows a creature, the demon, uh, with his magic flashlight. And he can see the coming and going of every gas phase particle. And if a particle's uh, in, in chamber B uh, of a two-part chamber uh, uh, of A and B, and, and if he sees a particle moving towards the barrier, he can open it, let it go through, otherwise keep it closed. Now they say that a picture is worth a thousand words, but I would as, add as a corollary that a bad picture can take many more words to correct. And I think it was a really bad picture because it's misleading. Um, in fact, the idea that you could, certainly you could, you could rig up a system where you could measure and, and feed back on a single particle or maybe a few particles. But the idea that you would do this for large ensembles approaching Avogadro's number is just unthinkable even today. And Maxwell said in 1871, he said, this is impossible to us. And I would claim that, that this is still impossible to us. So uh, the problem, the challenge with Maxwell's demon is that uh, there have been up to, up to recently, uh, there have been demonstration experiments involving, you know, kind of one particle at a time. But I, but I don't think that that, and while you can learn something from it, I don't mean to uh, downplay that work, but, but on the other hand, it doesn't have great utility and it was not in the spirit that Maxwell intended, as far as I understand it, which really dealt with large ensembles. And so, um, in, in fact, the, I, I think that uh, if you think about feeding back, you know, measurement and feedback, the closest that I can find uh, for large ensembles is the method of stochastic cooling. It, perhaps not known to all of you, but it is a famous method also recognized by Nobel Prize to Simon Vandermeer, who shared it with Carlo Rubia in 1984. Uh, the idea behind stochastic cooling is that you, if you have an ensemble, in this case of charged particles, protons in a ring accelerator, uh, you can uh, you can't detect each one individually, but what you can do is you can detect via a pickup coil um, the uh, the average uh, uh, centroid of the of the cloud, and 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 thereby measure a fluctuation. And uh, the pickup coil is the reason the atoms are radiating is because, of course, they're going in circular orbits. They're charged particles, so they are radiating, and that allows you to actually collect information about them. And what Vandermeer realized is that um, you could uh, measure the centroid of the position and there would be a fluctuation. And then uh, a quarter cycle later, that uh, fluctuation in position converts into a fluctuation momentum and then add a kicker coil. And by using fast electronics and using the fact that uh, even though these are relativistic particles that, they, that you can send, there's a shortcut and you can actually uh, do it fast enough to implement this kind of feedback cooling. And this re worked remarkably well. It worked because, uh, although it's slow, because if you have uh, N particles, you, the fluctuation is typically on the order of square root of N. And so there, therefore it is a slow process, but in a ring accelerator, the losses are very small and they can run the stochastic cooling for hours even and, 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 and compress the bunch 
And that actually was quite an important step because it increased the luminosity of the accelerator at CERN and allowed them, it allowed um, uh, Carlo Rubia to uh, observe the W and the Z bosons, confirming he part of the standard model of elementary particle physics. So this was a big, uh, I, I think a, a very important thing uh, to do, but um, stochastic cooling has not found applications beyond particle physics to best of our knowledge. Uh, we actually did an experiment years ago to kind of demonstrate stochastic cooling for atoms, but it really wasn't that useful. Uh, as far as I know, this is really the only example prior to what I'm gonna tell you today of, of working on large ensembles. Now, about um, a while back, now this goes back to about 18 years, um, we came up with an idea. I remember exactly when I thought of it. It was in an airplane, and I know which flight, where I um, asked a, a question, not really thinking about Maxwell's demon, just curiosity-driven. Can we make a one-way wall for atoms? So let's take the, the kind of the paradigm of the, of the, you know, the box with a separation in between can we make the wall that the partition in between one way in the sense that atoms can go one way, but they can't come back? Well, if you think about it a little bit, uh, we and we did uh, come up with at least one way to do it. And, uh, and we proposed this in this uh, paper, which got published. It was submitted in 2004. We had a lot of problems with referees, but finally it did get published. At first they didn't believe us. Then they said it's it's it works, but it's trivial. But in any case, finally um, we published it. and. It, it outlined a, a method to implement or make a construction that is a one-way wall for atoms. And the, the, the two components that you need, I believe, generally, are a conservative potential, which for us could be a magnetic field, which creates, a, 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 a for example, a repulsive barrier um, for the atoms, depending on which state they're in, uh, internal state, but we pick a state where they see a magnetic field as a repulsive barrier. But you also must have an irreversible process for us that is optical pumping. Now, for the people in the audience who are not atomic physicists, and my apologies to those who know this already, uh, let me say a few words about optical pumping. So this is a very successful method uh, invented by Alfred Kessler, in, in, who, shared, who won the Nobel Prize in 1966 for this work. He called it literally, in, to translate this, is literally cooling by light. But what he meant by that was not cooling the translational motion of atoms, but rather their internal state. And the way this works, if you imagine a, uh, in the upper part of the picture, you have a source of atoms that you evaporate, creating an atomic beam moving, moving to the right um, and shown here with, with arrows. And you intersect the beam with a, a laser, which we call a pump laser. And by using a particular polarization, you have quantum selection rules. So in the example that I show, the, I show a grounded and excited state of spin one in both states. So there's plus one, zero, and minus one states uh, in both the ground and the excited state. And if you start, when you start out, out of the oven, there's a thermal um, uh, distribution that equally populates all three uh, magnetic sublevels, Zeeman sublevels of the atom. Uh, but now when it, when it intersect, interacts with the laser beam, and in this case, you circular, right circular polar light induces a delta M equals plus one transition going up. And then on decay, spontaneous emission down, it can go into uh, different uh, M states. But what you see is that after several cycles of absorption and re-emission, um, in this case, you populate only the plus one state. So this optical pumping takes something that is uh, in, if you think about it, entropy had a large ent largest entropy because it was equally distributed among all possible states into a zero entropy state internally. Uh, you can also populate the zero state by using linear polarized light or the minus one state by using left circularly polarized light. So this is a wonderful tool that atomic physicists use all the time. But let's see how this could be used to make a one-way wall. So let's uh, let's imagine that we have this box and we turn on a magnetic field in the center, designated by the black, thick black line, that's a B field. And we'll start out with all the atoms, we'll optically pump them into the, into the M equals zero state. So I'm considering here the J equals one case, where we had one, zero, and minus one. So let's optically pump using linear polarized light, we can pump them all into the zero state. 
and ask what happens. Well, I'm not showing the atoms here because I was too lazy to draw them in, but you can imagine that if you, ha you have atoms on both sides bouncing around, uh, well, what happens? The answer is nothing because they don't see the magnetic field. They're in the M equals zero state. So they just happily go back and forth between both sides of this chamber and nothing, you haven't done anything. But now let's turn on an optical pumping beam shown in red. And the optical pumping beam is tuned such that when an M equals zero atom crosses it, it is optically pumped into an M equals one state. That state is repelled by the magnetic field. Well, now what happens? Uh, well, if you think about atoms that are on the left side, if they move to the right, the first thing they encounter is the laser, which pumps them into the M equals one state. Then they see the B field, which is a repulsive barrier, and they're turned back. On the right side, uh, they, if they're going to the left, they first go through the magnetic field, but nothing happens to them because they're, they're still in the M equals zero state. Then they encounter the optical pumping beam and pumped into the M equals one state, and they can't come back. They can't, because now if they try to come back, they see a repulsive barrier, assuming that their kinetic energy, of course, is, is low enough. And now, if I were to reverse the, the sequence, if I were to put the laser on the right side, I'd reverse the sign of the one-way wall. But, um, but so this was the idea, a very simple toy model. Uh, and of course, being an experimentalist, uh, you know, it's not enough to just propose a toy model. We actually have to do the experiment. The experiment is not a 1D or 2D box. It's actually in three dimensions. Uh, so this took a few more years, but in 2008, we demonstrated cooling with this method. Uh, we started out with laser cooled atoms and demonstrated that we could uh, cool them. And, and we measure cooling in terms of phase space density, which is the kind of the, the standard figure of merit in our community. Uh, in, in the initial paper in 2008, we achieved a 25 times compression in phase space, but in subsequent experiment, we went up to 350 times. So it was clear that this cooling does work. And it, it was not using, explicitly not using the momentum of the photon, um, but we'll get back to that point about entropy. Um, so uh, now uh, what I claim is that this one-way wall um, for all practical purposes acts like Maxwell's demon. And you know the old adage, uh, if it walks like a duck and quacks like a duck, it's Maxwell's demon. Right. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, but, but if there's any, anyone in the audience who might feel uncomfortable with the fact that optical pumping is Maxwell's demon, and I think I heard Bill Phillips express that, if I'm not mistaken, <laughs> uh, then um, I, I think one should ask, uh, what would Maxwell say? Then normally I would say, I don't know. But in this case, I have a friend who is a historian of science and, and expert on Maxwell, and he showed me a letter that Maxwell wrote to his friend, Lord Rayleigh, in which he says in his elegant language, I do not see why even intelligence might not be dispensed with and the thing made self-acting, allowing all particles going in one direction while stopping all those going the other way. So if I interpret that, what he was saying is the way this could work would be a one-way wall. So this is a self-acting device. Some people have called it an, a, a autonomous demon. Um, and uh, so I think, you know, if Maxwell, if Maxwell was okay with this, I think uh, in, in a way, um, and as far as I, I'm concerned, I believe this is the only way, although may, someone may prove me wrong, but I believe this is the only way to implement Maxwell's demon on large ensembles. That because, because I don't believe that feedback cooling, except for the, example of stochastic cooling will ever be practical, whereas this works, uh, the one-way wall works at the single particle level at maximum efficiency. In fact, we, we analyze this problem in terms of entropy, even though, strictly speaking, we're not, this process does not uh, proceed via thermal equilibrium, one can still talk about entropy. Um, and we can account for the, uh, as, as an atom crosses this, this laser beam and gets optically pumped, uh, it takes photons from the laser, which you could think about as a source of zero entropy photons, because they're all going in the same direction, and scatters it into four pi steradians, roughly, where uh, you, can, you can show and calculate the increase of entropy of the radiation field and show that, in fact, 
it, it balances out the decrease of entropy of the atomic cloud. So maybe we've taken out the uh, spookiness of Maxwell's demon because in the end, it, it is just a laser beam that is achieving optical pumping. But you can also interpret it in terms of information because uh, although we don't have a priori information, which the figure, the, the, the cartoon would imply and I say is impossible, we do have actually information as an atom crosses the one-way wall, it must emit a photon, at least one, but on, on the order of one. And in principle, you could detect that and say, have a clicker and say, aha, an atom just crossed. And so you really do have information in principle. Uh, and 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 that that is really all that you need that I claim. All right, so this was the situation back uh, more than 12 years ago or 13 years ago. Uh, we had worked on other tools, which I don't have time to talk about, of using, of, we, we learned how to make very large pulse magnetic fields on the order of uh, 10 Tesla pulse or more very short duration to create large field gradients and we're able to stop uh, supersonic beams of, of atoms, which very generally could work on any paramagnetic atom or molecule and, and showed this so-called atomic coil gun shown on the left side, combined with this cooling method, uh, which is the picture here shows actually how we did it at the time. It was in a magnetic trap. So it wasn't, it was a magnetic trap plus a tweezer, but um, so the details are not as, uh, are not exactly this as the simple picture that I showed earlier, but they are in spirit the same. Now, the only problem with this is that while this one-way wall cooling did compress phase space, uh, it didn't conserve atom number. And that, that's because uh, while it works in one dimension, it, it had the loss in the, in the other two dimensions. And so uh, although this was a demonstration, and I think a proof of, of realizing Maxwell demon at, uh, of, in this self-acting way, uh, it was not yet ready at, to be an alternative to evaporative cooling because the whole point of evaporative of, of our work was to to not lose atom number, and here we're losing atom number. So that that's still not completely satisfactory. So thinking about this more, <clears throat> um, came up with another idea, and and it was published in this paper called magneto optical cooling or MOP cooling, and I show a picture of a MOP because that's kind of how it works. Uh, we we kind of sweep atoms around. So the idea generally is that you have, if you can have cycles of optical pumping and magnetic kicks, but you must turn off the trap, which which is goes kind of against the grain of most atomic physicists. Let's just release the atoms and be free. They want to be free, so let them be free. The problem with being free is that then they expand freely and their phase space goes down, density goes down and they drop and all kinds of bad things happen. So you have to do this fast compared to free space expansion. Um, but here's how this works. Here's the idea for a, um, for, this, was, this was the spin one case, but I'm only considering two of the states. Uh, uh, one of them uh, is the M equals zero state and the other is the M equals one state and ignore the M equals minus one state. So um, let's let's imagine that we have a cloud with some initial spatial extent delta x zero shown on the left. Let's um, optically pump the so we, we let's optically pump them spatially. Now the way we do that is we we have a laser beam that will be tuned to optically pump the blue atoms, convert them into the m equals one shown in red. But we do it spatially because we we will shadow put a, a mask so that. Half of the cloud is is um, is then converted to m equals one, while the other half of the cloud is is untouched. Now, uh, then we apply a magnetic field gradient. Now, you might worry what happens to the other two dimensions, and that's something that we showed. Actually, Dima Budker was and Simon Rochester contributed to that, showing that uh, that it is actually possible to to apply a 1D gradient, even though, uh, I mean, a 1D kick rather, even though you can't have a pure 1D gradient by Maxwell's equations, it turns out because of dynamic averaging, you can, by putting a bias field on top of the gradient, you can, you can effectively get a 1D kick. So it doesn't perturb the other two dimensions. So this is where we're, we're acting in X direction and we're not gonna affect Y and Z. Um, and if we apply now a magnetic kick, of course, the m equals zero atoms don't move, 
but we will give a kick to the m equals one atoms, we'll start to move towards the m equals zero state. And when they spatially overlap, shown here where I have the two mixed colors, we apply a reverse kick. So now, we, now we've merged them together, but they're both at rest. <clears throat> and finally, to complete, the, to, to complete this cycle, we optically pump them back into the M equals zero state. And if you look at the start point and the end point, you see that we've compressed the density, the actual physical density by a factor of two in one dimension. So um, what we claimed at the time was that this is a general method. It does not rely on collisions. It does not proceed via thermal equilibrium. Uh, in principle, it, it is capable of achieving high phase space density with no loss of atoms, and it could be quite fast. Um, but at the time, we said, OK, one, one needs to do the experiment. And the experiment lagged behind for one reason, main reason. is So we, this was actually part of a proposal that was funded uh, in my group in, from 2015 to 8, 2018 where we incorporated all the new tools that I described earlier, including the Mach cooling, and we predicted that we could get a flux of an atom laser of about 10 to the 11 atoms per second. So if that, if that was true, we would, we would get a, a brightness that, that would be a million times higher than the state of the art. Now, we haven't done that yet. And we haven't done it yet for one reason, is that the Mach cooling was still not good enough. Because if you look at this picture, you see, okay, we compressed it by a factor of two, and that sounds great. But if you take into account the, the other imperfections and the fact that, that, the, that during this whole sequence, the cloud is expanding freely in three dimensions, then you're, even though you're gaining a factor of two in phase space um, per step, you're also losing something. So it'll be less than two and, and maybe 20%. So it's not that great. And so it was kind of discouraging and we just never really uh, implemented it for that reason. But, but last summer, uh, I went back to this problem and realized something that was missing. When I showed this picture, I, I showed the uh, only, I, I, had, I had a spin one case. And in principle, there's three states that were accessible. Spin, uh, M equals zero, M equals one, and M equals minus one. But I said, just forget about the minus one. That was not a good idea, because actually you can gain something by having more states. And I'm, I'm going to illustrate this. If, suppose instead of using, we had M equal, uh, J equals one, but I only used two of those states. But if we use all three states, then what happens? Well, uh, if you look at the upper picture shown in purple, and I'm just showing in one dimension, you start out in the M equals zero state. Now you use stimulated transitions to tag spatially uh, the three parts of the cloud. Uh, on the right side, let's say it's the plus one state, the middle remains the M equals zero state, and the left side shown in orange is the minus one state. And now you apply the, the same magnetic forces that I described, where we, we give a kick and then an anti-kick. And what will happen is, the, uh, the, the orange atoms are going to start moving to the right. The um, teal atoms will start moving to the left, and they're going to overlap together. And then we complete the optical pumping and bring them back to the M equals zero shown in purple. And again, now if you look, you, you see we've gained a factor of three times compression. Well, once you realize that, let's go to a larger number, larger spin. Uh, for example, if we have J equals two, now we can get a five times compression. The same trick. Uh, we, we now take our cloud and, and use all five states from M equals minus two to minus one, zero, plus one, and plus two. Those are five states. And those are color coded here. But the same principle applies. With the magnetic kick, we can compress it and then reverse the kick and optically pump. We get a factor of 5x. Okay, so uh, we've done uh, realistic simulations, uh, and actually there's room for improvement. So this is not, I would say, this is not completely optimized yet, but, but it shows the trend. Uh, it shows the, the compression factor on the vertical axis, and uh, the blue, which is way at the bottom, uh, corresponds to lithium. Well, that's a spin one half. 
all the alkali atoms on large field are, are spin one half, they're single electron atoms. The hydrogen decouples at strong field. Um, but as we go to atoms that are more par paramagnetic, higher magnetic moment, such as chromium uh, and erbium, which is uh, J equals six, dysprosium is J equals eight. So in principle, a J equals eight state should give us uh, two times eight plus one, which is 17 times compression. Now the simulation shows about 12 and a half. Uh, I think we can eke a little bit more, maybe up to 15, <laughs> but, but now this is getting to be a serious effect. That means in one, in one step of compression, we could get uh, at least 10 times more than 10 uh, uh, of compression in real space. And now you can do this in X, Y, and Z, and you can do it repeatedly. So this looks like this is a, a winner um, to go to these larger spin states. Um, now you might wonder, uh, optical pumping is optical pumping because, of course, as you go to a larger spin state, state uh, 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 spin system, you uh, you might worry that there's going to be more heating during optical pumping. And so this relates to work that I did with Dima Budger and other collaborators, which was published in 2016, called "Efficient Polarization of High Angular Momentum Systems," uh, in which we show, interestingly, that everything. Almost everything can be done with stimulated optical transitions that do not incur heating, but you do need at the very end of spontaneous emission. And in fact, the lowest number is an order of unity. So that says that that heating really can be pretty negligible, uh, even in this relatively high spin systems. And so we have a paper that was submitted for publication. Um, and it's on the archive called efficient, it's just a very similar title, but instead of efficient polarization, we call it efficient cooling of higher, of high angular momentum systems. And hopefully this will get published soon. And then the experiment will be done. Now, I, so this, let me come back to this point about achieving high, uh, high number. Uh, this is where I started my talk to get, um, uh, to produce an ultra bright atom laser. Why, why do we want to do that? Well, um, aside from you know, making general, of course, you can make general comments that any uh, precision measurements, uh, whether it's atom interferometry or atomic clocks, would benefit from having more ultra-cold atoms, even if we don't reach quantum degeneracy. In other words, we don't have to get all the, all the way to, a, to an atom laser. Uh, to just say that, that it's better if we can cool more atoms and get rid of the evaporative cooling. Uh, and but but to be more specific, uh, there, this is actually motivated by several uh, recent papers and and planned experiments. Uh, one of them is this paper from 2021 uh, called "Non-Gaussianity as a Signature of Quantum Theory of Gravity." So this is uh, the idea, uh, actually, due to Penrose, that instead of talking about quantum gravity, you talk about gravitizing quantum mechanics by making the equivalence principle the most important thing and seeing what effects this could have on, on gravity. And very specifically, they propose an experiment where one starts with a Bose condensate and measures correlations, actually do what's called quantum state tomography, which would show a negative Wigner function. And I don't have time to go into this, but I'll just say that, that this was part of the motivation, but the, the key thing is you need a lot of atoms and heavy atoms. The other one, this was a, a paper, a SAGE proposal for a, um, a gravitational uh, a, an experiment in space, uh, space atomic gravity explorer to investigate gravitational waves, dark matter, and other fundamental aspects of gravity uh, using new quantum sensors, et cetera. Uh, but the interesting point is that both these proposals require fluxes that are on the order for atom lasers of about 10 to the 11 atoms per second. And so I think this would, is timely to find an alternative to evaporative cooling. And, and this, um, uh, this, um, this, this is where we're headed. And in fact, uh, we, we have a proposal in, actually it'll be submitted officially tomorrow. We, were, we went through the first round. We, we passed actually the first round in this uh, selection uh, process. And we were invited to a full proposal to the Sloan Foundation which is working together with the Moore and the Templeton Foundation to fund 
tabletop test of fundamental physics. And we call our proposal putting gravity in context, uh, which is related exactly to this, uh, this type of gravitizing quantum mechanics. And it's due tomorrow. So, uh, so I have some work tonight still, but, <laughs> but, but it will be submitted tomorrow. And, and then we just keep our fingers crossed. Um, in the time that remains, and, and how much time do I have, actually? Um, it's five minutes, okay. That'd leave five minutes left for, for questions. Five minutes, okay. I'll, 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 I'll try to wrap it up in five minutes. Okay, so, thanks. Th this would, um, uh, I wanna, uh, the message I wanna leave you is that uh, aside from, you know, I, I, I intentionally, when I came up with the title, I, I left it open that it's not just cooling atoms, but also controlling them. And what do I mean by that? What, what, what's an interesting type of control? And uh, it turns out a very interesting type of control is isotope separation. This is a longstanding challenge. Uh, of course, you've heard of separation with centrifuge, but that's really only used primarily or primarily used for uranium separation. But for the rest of the periodic table, we rely on a very old method that was invented by Ernest Lawrence back in the 40s called the Calutron. Uh, Cal U was the university and Tron is like cyclotron, Calutron. It's a, it's a big, essentially a big mass spectrometer. It's very energy intensive, requires huge magnetic fields over large volumes. Uh, the only remaining large calutrons today are in Russia. Needless to say, that's not a very stable situation. But we came up with an idea, which we called magnetically activated and guided isotope separation, MAGIS, which turns out to exactly use the same ideas of the one-way wall and photon entropy. Um, and just very briefly, the, the way this works is uh, is having an atomic beam on the left and a, a, an effusive atomic beam and having arrays of permanent magnets arranged in a particular configuration that maximizes the surface magnetic field. But there's no line of sight from the from the uh, source to the collector. So unless unless it it bounces off those those magnetic arrays, and that's where optical pumping comes in because it it allows you to select out those isotopes due to the isotope shift uh, that you want and reject all of the others. Um, the advantages of this method are that optical pumping can be done at the, at the cost of only a few photons per atom. And you don't normally, in laser cooling, you don't worry about your efficiency of using photons, but when you want to create a mole of something, a mole of an isotope, you have to talk how many moles of photons do you need, and it quickly becomes unreasonable. So you really do need to stay on the level of one or or a few photons per separated atom. Uh, because it's uh, magnetic fields that are from permanent magnets, there's no current drawn. And um, what's really exciting is that uh, this is gonna open up a completely new method of separation of hot isotopes as an alternative to radiochemistry. When the, uh, when the target element and the radioisotope are the same element and can't be separated by chemistry, our method can work. And, in fact, uh, this is um, reminiscent of what's called the historic pointsman of the railways, a picture shown here. Um, uh, this actually turned out to be the motivation, if you read the history. This is what motivated James Clerk Maxwell in the first place to think of, of his demon, was the pointsman of the railways, because that person, what, by a very simple action, by free will, could alter the path, because that's the demon, alter the path of this big train going one way versus another. And very different than Newtonian point of view that if you know the equations of motion, you can predict the position momentum of a particle at later times. In the case of a pointsman, um, we can alter that. And, and that is really the demon. That's how Maxwell thought about it originally. Um, and that led me back in about um, now seven years or so ago, to create a nonprofit foundation, which I called the Pointsman Foundation for historical reasons. Uh, and the, the initial starting point of, for a Pointsman Foundation is to use the methods that we developed to reduce the cost of separated isotopes and to make them available uh, for medicine. And, and now I'm also uh, at the Dell Medical School as a professor of pediatric medicine. So a lot of my work relates to uh, the interface between physics and medicine. Uh, the Poinson Foundation was created. Uh, it's a nonprofit foundation. I'm chairman of the board. We have mostly medical doctors and a few physicists. Um, uh, we have a subsidiary, which is 100% owned 
by the foundation called Pointsman Lab, it's a S corporation, uh, which will conduct all the activities of the foundation. And, and we've created subsidiary companies. The first company is called Adam Mines LLC, which is now producing ultra high uh, enriched deuterium 176 for cancer therapy. Uh, the, the Pointsman Labs, and which are now uh, in progress, the first one in Austin, but I'm in discussion with other locations uh, for possible Pointsman Labs uh, in, in collaboration and possible a partnership with other, not, uh, at least one very large foundation, which will remain unnamed. Uh, but the, uh, the, the idea is advances in the physical sciences to benefit humanity. This will be sort of a Bell Labs type of place in different locations. And just to give you a flavor of some of the projects, these are current projects, uh, we are already producing uh, at one isotope, and there are many more in the pipeline for cancer therapy and also diagnostics. Uh, th this is in progress at a subsidiary company called Adam Mines, as I said. Uh, we have new platforms for quantum limited medical diagnostics, which will be include early cancer detection, also from isotope, uh, stable isotope detection, uh, prevention of iron deficiency, again, looking at iron isotope ratios in collaboration with a pediatrician in, on our board. Uh, this affects 50% of all children in the world. If they don't get sufficient iron at a young age, they've suffered permanent brain impairment and it affects their whole life. So this is a really global healthcare crisis and, and is preventable. Uh, clean water from air, the limb of thermodynamics. Actually, clean water has just been in the news today and uh, forever chemicals are going to be banned. And it's a real problem uh, to get clean drinking water and prevention of infectious disease. Some of our work uh, on uh, stopping biofilms with beta emitters uh, show very promising results. So th there's a lot of things going on. And uh, I think this is very exciting. If you want to read more, look at our website, www.pointsman.org. In particular, look at our projects uh, tab. You can, you can read more about our activities. And it also tells the story, this the historical story of the Pointsman and James Clerk Maxwell. So um, I will end here uh, and thank you for your attention.